Hello, and welcome to another episode of Who Rescued Whom? Canine Rescue Tales. Today's guest is Carrie from small town Texas. She became a bank teller while getting her MBA, and during that time, she tapped into her love of rescuing and fostering. It became her passion and her dream. She became known as the town rescuer. Well, I was a bank teller. I've worked part-time there. So when I wasn't working, I was fostering. I established a really great bond with the animal shelter at Sulphur Springs. Her name was Barbara. She would always message me whenever she had a dog or a cat that just wasn't getting rescued as quickly. They were unfortunately a kill shelter. So if an animal had outstayed their welcome, I suppose you could say, then that unfortunately was the end of that animal's life. So she would always call me before that happened. And I would always take in as many as I possibly could, which essentially leads us to my Rosie. I was known in my town as the rescuer. Everybody knew if they gave me a, I'm about to take this animal to the the pound. Do you want her? Do you want him? I would take them in. So a lady that owned a local sandwich shop in Sulphur Springs, Texas came in. I was very used to her coming directly to me. She said, hey, I have a, a German shepherd that she's just not working out for our family. She's a really sweet dog, but we don't have a fence. We can't keep her contained. And she just, we need to give her into a, a, a new home that will actually be able to give her the attention that she needs. German shepherds are one of the easiest ones, in, in my opinion, that you can foster and that you can rehome. So I had no intention at all of adopting this creature. I, I just knew I could absolutely find her a home quickly. I didn't want her to end up at the shelter and I told her absolutely I'll swing by her house and pick her up that day. Fostering isn't for everyone. Sometimes it's hard to let them go. Carrie made a rule for herself that helped her solve that problem. Well I had two dogs prior to fostering. My golden number was three. I was only allowed to have three dogs at all times. I knew if I ever adopted a third dog, then that would be the end of my fostering career. Not a lot of people understand how fosters can do it because they're like, you get attached to them too easy. How do you know they're going to a better home? My thought process when I'm fostering is I'm saving more animals. It puts your mind in the right mindset of this is why you do it. I would bond with them. I would give them love. And then when we found them the correct home, it felt right. So I didn't have any remorse letting them go to their new homes. But then there was Rosie. Carrie tells us why her experience fostering Rosie was just a bit different. For Rosie, on the other hand, I I adopted her out to this couple out of Dallas and they seemed great over the phone. I, of course, was having that smidget of doubt, but that was just because I'm partial to German Shepherds. And I met with this couple. I brought Rosie with me, and it was the meeting for them to take her home. So there was essentially no backing out for me at that time. And As soon as I handed that leash over, my heart just sank, and my heart was just like on the floor, crumbled as they were walking away with my dog. Carrie later found out that the adopters she'd found for Rosie intended to breed her. Carrie wasn't a fan of small backyard breeding operations. Once I found that information out, I mean, it was probably three to four times a week. I would just email them and go, hey, how's Rosie working out for you guys? Is she doing good? I'm just letting you know if she's not going to work out for you guys, just hit me up. I'll be more than happy to come and get her. Um, They, of course, have to pay adoption fees. I was like, I'll pay the adoption fee. I'll reimburse it. Just you you guys let me know if she doesn't work out for you. And then I never anticipated, but I had always had a hope in the back of my mind that they would eventually reach out to me. And then about a month in, they did reach out to me and they were like, hey, do you still want Rosie? She's too small of a dog to breed. We don't want her anymore. And my heart, it was very, oh my goodness, I get my dog back. So I was like, absolutely, I will be right there. Carrie left to go get Rosie. But when she arrived, 
she noticed something. She was a completely different dog from when I had dropped her off until when I went to go pick her up. It was, she looked, you could tell she just wasn't happy with them. And then when she saw me, she was like, okay, a familiar face. I remember this woman. She actually did treat me nice and she loved on me and she was very excited. She jumped in my car and she never left my front seat. She was just like, hey, let's go home. <laughs> Carrie told us about her special relationship with Rosie. She was my everything. She was there for me. I was diagnosed with ankylosing spondylitis, which is an inflammation. So I'm in constant pain. And the only thing that I found helped with that pain was working out, exercising, going on walks and runs. And so she became my running buddy. We would go running throughout the town. We would do miles a day and Every time I would go running with her, she would just constantly look up at me with this huge smile. And you could tell that being next to me running together was, it was her passion. She just loved being next to me at all times. She was my partner in crime. Whenever we had anybody out to either do the bug spray or whatever, she would always be right in front of me and she would never let anybody near me. If she didn't feel comfortable with them, nobody was getting between her and I. It was just, she was my protector. And she would not always sleep next to me at night. Her spot was right next to me. And and I, I loved that. I loved knowing that I was safe with her. And I, I think she knew that she was safe with me too. So we loved exploring and going out and adventuring. So going to Beaver's Bend and all of that fun stuff. That was our special times together. Being a responsible dog owner, Carrie took her dogs to the vet annually for checkups. So I bring them in for their yearly exams every year. And lo and behold, Rosie got her blood work and my doctor called me and he said, hey, Rosie's blood is showing some high levels, but she's only five. These are very common to have false positives. So whenever you guys have a chance, just swing her back by and we'll get her tested again. So I took her in for blood work again and they got the blood work back fairly quickly. So within a day turnaround and the levels were even higher. So I asked my doctor, what does this even mean? Why are her levels returning so high? And he had this flush white look on his face when he told me she's in acute kidney failure. Of course, when I get bad news, I always go into fight mode. I'm like, okay, so what do we do to fix this? Her vet kept her for three nights, but then called Carrie and told her she should take Rosie to the Texas A&M College of Veterinary Medicine in College Station, Texas. According to Carrie, Texas A&M is the place you go when the local vet can't treat the problem in their office. They kept her for one full week. Day seven, they called me and they said her levels aren't getting any better. We can keep her on fluids and it keeps her levels steady, but the moment that she's off of fluids, her levels just continue to rise. So I said, what are my options? And they said, at this point, we give her a month. And my heart just, I was on the phone just bawling. I was like, there's nothing we can do. I I can find a kidney donor. I'll take her to California. I've already done research. I knew that there were two places I could do dialysis in America, and I was going to find them. And they said, I don't think that that's really going to save her at this time. And I said, she's five years old. How could this have even happened? Like, What could have triggered acute kidney failure in such a healthy dog? She was fine. And they said, something as simple as one great could have done this to her. According to the ASPCA, ingestion of grapes and raisins has been associated with acute renal failure in dogs. Because Carrie is a vegetarian, she feared that perhaps a grape from a salad could have made its way to the floor where Rosie would have gotten to it. Though she doesn't know that for sure, she wants people to be aware of this potential danger. Carrie knew that there was nothing else they could do. I said, okay, well, I'm coming to get her because I don't want her to be in some random strange place. If you guys are only going to give her a month, we're going to have the best month ever. For the next few weeks, Carrie and Rosie spent quality time together. Also during this time, she experimented with different foods to ensure Rosie would eat in order to keep her strength up. It was a difficult time all around because Carrie continued to have to go to work daily. 
my heart was just telling me, you can't keep her alive because you want to be selfish. She's at home right now and she's struggling. She has such a very low dimmer to her eyes. She, she doesn't have much life left in it. And you can tell that she's ready to go. She's just waiting for me to be ready too. I called my vet and I was crying and they knew as soon as they answered the phone, they knew it was me and they knew what those cries were for. And they said, we can be there today at 5.50. And I was like, okay, that sounds like a plan. Let's make it happen. I was very grateful that they would even come out to my home and let her go in peace. It was the worst moment of my life watching them pull into my driveway because I knew it was time. And I'm sitting on Rosie's bed with her and she has her head in my lap. I'm looking down at her and I'm like, okay, my brother had passed away. And I was like, go find my brother. He's going to take care of you because he absolutely loves, loves, loves Fox too. So you go up, you go up to heaven and you go find him and he's going to take care of you until I can get with you again. My vet comes in and he's giving me my time to, to say my goodbyes to her. And I'm kissing on her nose and telling her that I love her more than anything and, and that everything's going to be okay. Carrie cradled and loved on Rosie while the vet proceeded with the process of putting her to sleep. It was difficult, but Carrie knew in her heart that it was the most unselfish thing she could do. Having experienced these losses ourselves, Diane and I have come to the conclusion that although it may be easier to leave a pet with your vet for such a heartbreaking procedure, we believe that like Carrie, sitting with your pet, loving on them, and being strong for them gives them peace and provides closure for you. Making the decision to euthanize an animal, especially a beloved pet, can be traumatic. In our next episode, episode 8, the final episode of season 1, you will hear from our veterinarian, Dr. Rick Sofel. He will explain the process of euthanasia and how to make that ultimate decision. Dr. Sofa will also share a special rescue story of his own. As Carrie described, losing Rosie nearly broke her. Even her other dog, a husky named Outlaw, was showing signs of sadness at Rosie's loss. Many people find it difficult to think of getting another dog after such a painful loss. I don't think I ever want to go through this heartache ever again. Well, two to three weeks goes by and I'm like, okay, this isn't what Rosie would want for me. She wouldn't want me to shut my entire heart down to opening up to another love. This is not what she wants. She wants me to continue fostering, saving lives, all that good stuff. So I told myself to get over this pain that the years of happiness that a dog can bring you, it outweighs the pain that they leave when they leave this earth. I knew I needed another shepherd because there's something very special with German shepherds. They are not only protective, they're just kind and the most loyal dog you will ever find. So I got online and the first place that popped up was my good shepherd. This sounds like a great rescue to go through. They were out of Dallas and I was ready for an adventure again. So I loaded up Outlaw. He doesn't like many dogs, so we're going to we're going to give him a chance to find his friend again. They had probably a good 10, 15 dogs available. So we went through every single dog at that event. And there was one little scrawny dog, long-haired German Shepherd that was sitting in the back. She didn't want to have anything to do with anybody. She was abandoned in the heart of Dallas in a grocery cart. So we go up to her and outlaw and her kind of sniff each other. And then they both go back to back. 
everywhere they're looking, they're growling at every dog that's walking by, but they are back to back doing this. So it's kind of like, you get that side, I'll get this side. We're going to tag team these dogs. So <laughs> I was like, okay, well, I guess they're a match made in a very strange heaven, but they, they seem to like each other. The Who Rescued Whom Canine Rescue Tales podcast makes a donation to the rescue of choice in honor of the guests we feature on each episode. Carrie would like this episode's donation to go to Good Shepherd Rescue of Texas. Founded in 1999, Good Shepherd Rescue of Texas is a volunteer group operating in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. They focus on the rescue, rehabilitation, and rehoming of German Shepherd dogs, as well as Belgian Malinois and Dutch Shepherds. All dogs in their program are in private foster homes. They provide medical care for gravely ill or injured dogs. They spay or neuter, microchip, vaccinate, deworm, heartworm test, and heartworm treat if needed. Their volunteers give freely of their time, money, and affection to save these animals. You can find a link to Good Shepherd Rescue of Texas, along with pictures of Carrie and her dogs, show notes, and an entire script for the hearing impaired on the episode page of our website, whorescuedwhom.com. Carrie said that Hope, now renamed Lexi, was doing many of the same things that Rosie did, and she took this as a sign from Rosie that she had found Lexi for her. I have never, ever, ever found a dog that clicked with me so quickly as Lexi did for me. She's incredible. I now have Lexi doing everything that Rosie had done. Rosie is trying to tell me that she's okay and that she wants me to be okay too. Just as we do in all of our episodes, we ask Carrie of her dogs, who rescued whom? Oh, they 100% rescued me. They have been through some of the biggest life changes in my life. And if it wasn't for them, I don't know if I would necessarily be the person I am today. Because Carrie has fostered and rescued many animals, we asked her to give our audience a word of encouragement about rescuing. There will never be a more grateful creature in your life than a rescue. They have seen things that we can only imagine. They've either been abused, they have been starved to death. They know what it's like to be in a horrible situation. So when you adopt a creature that has been in such a horrible situation and you give them a beautiful home filled with love, they will give that back to you tenfold. Carrie shared a quote from author and canine psychologist Karen Davison. One of my favorite quotes is, saving one dog will not change the world, but for that one dog, the world will change forever. And that is something that I absolutely live by. It's very difficult knowing how many dogs in this world are alone. They don't have a family and you want to rescue everybody and you can't because it's just not, it's not feasible. It's not possible. But if you can open up your family to one dog, I can promise you, you will have a best friend forever. Our dogs, Missy, Stormy, Jake, Cody, and now Rex and Zoe have brought John and I nothing but joy in the 14 years we have been rescuing these precious dogs. Yes, there is heartache when we lose one of them, but the renewed joy with each new rescue makes it all worth it. And even though they can't tell us, we know from the wag of their tail or simply the look in their eyes upon seeing us first thing in the morning that they have received an equal measure of joy from the fact that they have been given a real home a second, or in some cases, perhaps even a third chance at a great life in a loving family. As we said earlier, our next episode, that will post on July 25th, will be the final episode of this first season of the Who Rescued Whom Can End Rescue Tales podcast. We will be back in the fall with more rescue stories. If you have missed any of our previous episodes, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. You can download all season one stories and enjoy them while on vacation or even while walking your dog. 
Do you have a rescue story you'd like to share with our audience? We'd love to talk with you about being a part of our podcast. Just go to the Be a Guest page on our website, whorescuedwhom.com, and fill out our future guest information form. You can also email us at info at whorescuedwhom.com or message us through our Facebook page. This podcast was edited and produced by Mike McClellan at podcastps.com. Mike also wrote, performed, and produced all the music that you heard on this episode.